The ego's mantra, seek, prove, build, get out there, never find, never really succeed, never really feel complete, never really feel good, but keep trying, keep hanging out there, and I'll give you just enough recognition here and there. I'll give you crumbs to keep you going. So we're in the fourth week of Metaphysical Bible Summer Camp. We kicked off our journey with the metaphysical interpretation of Adam and Eve, and we talked about the lie of separation. And that's really what the myth shows us. Uh, and when we flipped it over, we realized that it wasn't about God throwing us out of the oneness in the Garden of Eden. It was about us dreaming ourselves separate from God. Then we moved to explore the Bible story of Jonah and the whale. What a super rich story that many of us could relate to. You know, when you feel that internal calling from God to make a difference, to help out, and instead of moving toward that calling, you move in the opposite direction, you run away so that you don't have to answer that call. And what can happen to us inside of ourselves when we do that? And then last week, we explored uh, probably the second most famous story, David and Goliath, which is really about love versus fear, love versus the ego, and how to conquer the uh, monsters of fear inside of you, and the fact that you are perfectly, perfectly wired to do so. You came in, you incarnated with the right perfect gifts and talents and spiritual qualities that you were meant to have to move through life successfully. And today we cover what I think is the number one most known story, which with so much in it, which is the prodigal son. I've spoken on this hundreds of times and I will speak on this hundreds and hundreds of times more because it truly does tell a very, very familiar story on so many layers. I mean, there's just layers and layers and layers. So my intention is to go to a deeper layer than we ever have. And I invite you to open yourself up to hear this story in a brand new way. Not, oh yeah, I've heard that, but what's new here for me? But let's begin by recapping the story itself. So I kind of like just tell it in modern language. I'm just going to kind of make it more, more understandable that way. So there's this really rich dad, like more money, more good, more manifestations that he could ever, ever spend in 10 lifetimes. He's got two sons. He's got the prodigal son and the good son. And so as the story goes, the prodigal son comes of age and he goes into his father's office and he says, Give me my inheritance. I'm out of here. So the father, with all the love in his heart, gives to the prodigal son his rightful inheritance. And the prodigal son takes off. He leaves. He heads out of town as fast as he can. And let's say he goes to a rock and roll city like New York. And he gets himself the penthouse on the highest building. And he just goes for it. He's just party city seven days a week. Now, he's got lots of friends coming to join him because, hey, wherever the free party is, why not? So he's filling his home with lots of different people, and he's just king of the hill. Highest tower, best apartment, amazing view, people all around him loving him and thanking him, partying it up morning, noon, and night. Well, the prodigal son is just running on these resources that he's been given, but they run out pretty quickly. And so what happens? The friends start to leave. He becomes more and more lonely, depressed, afraid, disconnected. And so he starts, let's say he starts partying and using more and just gets more and more and more contracted by the fear and the disconnection and the isolation. He loses that beautiful penthouse, that's gone. Of course, all the friends disappear. And he finds himself in a dark back alley, all by himself, 
so lost, so forlorn. Now, in the story, the original story, it says he finds himself in a pig pen working with the pigs, like taking care of them. That's the best he can create. But inside of that deepest bottom, he has a revelation. And he thinks, I could go back and work for my father. I could get a meager job for my father and have a better life than this. So he decides to begin returning home. And as he gets closer to home, he, you know, he hangs heavier and heavier, the shame and the guilt, and he's just walking one step at a time, like really kind of imagine practicing his, his speech, his apology to his father and begging for him, just give me a job, please. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, the father sees him coming. And the father is filled with so much unconditional love. He goes running out the front door. He runs down the long driveway and he's running down the road to meet his son. And his son sees his father coming. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm not worthy of this. I'm not worthy. No, just give me a job. All I want is a job playing smaller and smaller and smaller. But the father won't see it. He won't have it. All he sees is his son is home. And he wraps his arms around him and he's loving him. Now imagine his son is all beaten and torn and smelly and his father just loves him. Brings him into the house, gives him the opportunity to clean up and decides to throw a huge party. My son is home. I've got to let the world know. And so he brings out the best foods and the best everything and he invites everyone. It's a huge welcome home experience. Now during the party, the father notices his other son, the good son, pouting way far away in a corner by himself. And so the father goes over to see what's going on with him. And as he gets closer, he can tell this son is pissed off. He is so angry. And he goes up and he says, what's wrong? Your brother is home. This is a time of celebration. And the good, the good son blows up. He says, this is ridiculous. I have been the one to stay here. I have been the one to take care of our companies. I have been the one working morning, noon, and night to assure that all that we have grows and multiplies. And that guy takes off and blows it all. And this is what you give him? A party? And the father, with all the love in his heart, just looks at the son and he says, my son, your brother is home. He was lost and now he's found. We must celebrate. And please know that all that I have, all that I have been given is yours and always yours. So that's the story. Now, let's look at this metaphysically because obviously that's where it gets really rich. Okay? So the father represents the love of God. It's the love of spirit inside of you. It is the beam of light in the center of your being that never judges. It knows nothing but the extension of itself is who you are. It doesn't see the negativity. It doesn't buy into the broken stories. It doesn't play the game of separation. It is the light and the love of God from which you come. I say it every Sunday. We cannot know the place where God ends and you begin. There is no knowing of that because it is one stream of unconditional love. Please, let's pause right there and breathe that in with me. The unconditioned, perfect love of God resides in you and it is that from which you have come. So that's the father of the story. Good place to begin, right? Now, the prodigal son represents the part in us that out of shame and guilt and the ego believes that we're separate from God. And the ego part of ourselves has to thinks that it has to build its own kingdom. It thinks it has to separate itself from the collective and it needs to make a stand of its own. The ego inside of us is out to prove in the world. It's out to conquer in the world. It's out to impress in the world. It never believes itself worthy. In fact, the ego depends on you believing 
you're not worthy. The ego depends on you not wanting to commune and merge with the will of God that is so perfect for you. The ego whispers inside of your ear, you must find your own way. You must build your own kingdom. You must prove your own worthiness. The ego sets us off on a course that will never, ever, ever lead to anything good. The ego's mantra is seek and never find. You got that? The ego's mantra, seek, prove, build, get out there, never find, never really succeed, never really feel complete, never really feel good, but keep trying, keep hanging out there, and I'll give you just enough recognition here and there. I'll give you crumbs to keep you going. So all we get in the world is crumbs. Sure, you might have a big score in the world. You might get a little recognition. You might get a big win, but it's temporary if it's not anchored first in the love of God. And that's what the prodigal son represents inside of us. It's the part of us believing itself separate from God takes its inheritance and goes off and tries to build on its own, which is impossible. It is literally impossible because you never can separate from the love and the power of God. You can pretend, you can dream it, you can try, but you'll never, ever, ever succeed. What you will do is eventually hit a place of so much pain, so much loneliness, so much loss, that the only place to turn is back to God. Those of us who have struggled with addictions and really bottomed out, understand that. Those of us who have bankrupted, lost all that we built, understand that. Those of us who have suffered great illness in the body, lost a loved one to death. We know the pain so dark, the back alley experience of being so alone that even when we don't know what God is, it's all the words we have is to cry out for help. In this story, it shows us the extreme consequence of that. The bigger danger, listen up, take a breath. The bigger danger is for those of us who don't reach the extreme bottoming out, but just create a life further enough out to make us think we're succeeding. And we're in pain, but not enough pain. We're in pain, but we're not bottoming out. We're building in the world and we're experiencing enough success and falling down that we can keep ourselves toggling out there. That's the ones I'm more worried about. The ones who bottom out, the addicts who crash and burn and call out to God, they're covered. It's those of us who are in the middle and that may be you. Please be willing to look. Where am I in pain, but not enough pain to change? Where am I experiencing just enough success and recognition in the world that I give it value and I can leave God out of it, at least not in my moments, but overall, this is an important thing. The story shows the bottoming out. If you don't bottom out, will you be stuck forever out there like the prodigal son? Of course you won't be, but we wanna get you home quickly. So wherever you are, all the way to the bottoming out, or halfway there, this is your moment to breathe and go, I want to go home to God. I want to go home to the oneness with spirit. And that's what happens to the prodigal son. Now, it's an interesting thing because in the story, it says that he is, you know, in ancient times, that he is in uh, taking care of the pigs in a pig pen. Now, this is a Jew in the pig pen. Now, so that's got extra drama because, of course, if you know the Jewish culture, the pigs are not to be eaten or, or, or messed with on any level. So it really just shows an even deeper level of how far down he's gotten. So he starts moving his way back to God, which is that wake up moment that I pray for, for you and for me. I pray for that wake up moment when I get two steps out. I'm not interested in the long journey to bottoming out anymore. I'm not interested in two steps out. I know the ego does that, but pray, pray, pray us home. So the prodigal son returns, the unconditional love of God is there, right? Welcome home. All the love of God sees is its own beautiful creation. And he brings him home. Now I want to pause here and talk about the inheritance. 
because in the world of form, I use the analogy of money and, and penthouses and, you know, it's spending things of this world to get things of this world. But that's not your spiritual inheritance. And there's a larger price we pay when we deplete our spiritual inheritance. And what is your spiritual inheritance? Your joy, your passion, your creativity, your divine ideas of which there are infinite solutions inside of you, a forever blossoming garden of, of love and joy and power and peace. All of that is your inherent inheritance. All of that has been given to you. And on that, you can build and create from and as God all that you want and more. Now, this is what truly gets lost. That's really what suffers. The things of this world come and go. But if you hang out too far out in the prodigal son land, it is the soul that dies. Not completely. There'll always be a string, but the dying soul is the most painful because that's where the loneliness and the isolation and the depression and the suicidal tendencies live. It's in the dying of the soul. And that's the inheritance that was lost. But as soon as he returns to God, it begins to restore itself. And it's literally given back to him immediately. No scorekeeping. No, hey, you blew it. You got to do penance. No, fill up, back up. It's infinite. Fill up to the inheritance of God. Always yours when you come home. But one of the most important parts I want to focus on in the story is the good son. Oh, the good son. We all have that inside of us. We have the prodigal egoic part that wants to go away and separate from God. And that one's obvious, but the good son, the good son is being conditioned by religions and by culture and by family. And the good son says, don't be yourself, pretend, be good, be nice, be kind, do your part and then you'll win. Climb the ladder, then you'll succeed. Get this degree, make sure that you do this right. Build up your, your ways of the world, be good according to the plan of the ego and the family structure and society, and then you will succeed. And that's the part of us. It's like, cover up your authenticity. Don't be too loud. Don't want for too much. Keep it under wraps. Don't be you. Be good in the name of earning favor from God, which is just as much BS as the prodigal part of us going away, trying to build separate from God. That is a bigger lie in the middle of this story that I want all of us to become free from today. You can't be good enough for God and you can't be bad enough to reject God. The only way to know God is in your authenticity, to be who you are. Am I saying don't be nice? Of course not, but be authentically nice. Don't be an overlay of fake nice so that you can be loved and accepted and so God will approve. Don't be an overlay of pretending so that you're acceptable in the eyes of God. That is, makes me furious. That's what religions did to us. That's what happened to us as very young kids. We got captured and we were told that we have to be good. Santa Claus was watching, making a list and checking it twice. That is trauma to a young kid's mind, trying to be other. Then we have a selfish thought. We have a sexual urge. We have a, an impulse of, of joy. And inside of us, it says, no, 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 turn that off. Don't let anyone know this is here. Because if I show my truth, I'm going to get laughed at. I'm going to get ridiculed. I'm going to get shamed. I'm going to be punished. The good son is a lie. It's a lie. And many of us have been walking the world pretending to be good, pretending to be who we think or who we were trained to be so that we were acceptable to our parents, to the world, and to God. Again, I want to reiterate, I am not saying don't be good, don't be kind, don't be generous. Be that from your authenticity. And when you let yourself be authentic, that will naturally appear and you'll have your own rhythm. 
I'll never forget this story about Oprah. She was telling the story about talking to Stedman, um, her, I don't know if she's still with Stedman or whatever, but at that time it was Stedman. And she was talking to him about struggling to be nice. She's like, I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be nice. And as the story goes, Stedman said to her, Oprah, don't bother. You're not nice. That's not who you are. And that was a revelation. That was a revelation to her because she realized, oh, this isn't one of my authentic character traits. And as she gave up trying to be nice, I have no doubt, niceness flows. I mean, this is one of the most generous women, spiritually evolved women on our planet today. But it's when you're trying trying to be it, when you're being the good son. So can you see how both the good son and the prodigal son, two sides of the same coin, exist inside of you? And in fact, they support each other because after the good part of the trying to be good part of you has had enough efforting, you know what it says? Screw it. I'm out of here. I'm going to go get my own. And the prodigal son takes over. So it really is flipping a coin. It's the same. It's one. It's the same broken parts coming together, working in partnership to keep you separate from God. And when we come home to God, all is ours. And what does God say to the good son? The same thing to the prodigal son. Look, man, play your games. All I have is yours. Now you're going to have to come get it and be in alignment with home. You can't sit out here pouting and get it. Please hear that. You can't sit outside pouting and comparing and keeping score and competing. And why did she get it and I didn't? You'll never get God's grace from there. But you will get it when you recognize, oh, this is the good part. And this is the trying to be good part in me. Whoo, let that go. Come home to God. So when we bring the prodigal part of us home to God, and when we bring the part of us that's trying desperately to be good to seek favor home to God, then we're centered in the will of God, which is only good, which is only generous and abundant, which is a joy that is beyond your understanding. This is the gift. And this is the metaphysical interpretation of the prodigal son. It's the story of all of us, yes? Take a deep breath. Let's move into prayer. Welcoming back Amy and Jesse, our prodigal son and daughter. <laughs> Take a deep breath, everybody, as we turn within and let them lead us in with song. It's by the It's by thy grace that I sing. It's by thy grace yes. that I sing your holy name. Oh, it's by thy And it is God's grace that brings us home and allows us to feel the holiness, the wholeness, the oneness with God. Again, where I began, it is established inside of us as an ever-flowing, never-ending, infinite stream. And we are that. And so today we call upon the grace of God to bring home in us the prodigal parts, the parts that in defiance and fear, shame and guilt, have gone away from God and tried to make a life. God's grace, bring those parts home with total unconditional acceptance now. And to the parts of us that are faking it, putting on facades of niceness and kindness and, and dimming our light to fit in, thinking that that will bring us reward. Oh, God's grace, bring that part of us home now once and forevermore. 
It is the grace of God that allows us to lay down the games and to just be here, to let God's grace flow through us and to use us, to use our hearts, to use our minds, to use our voice, to use our hands, to be the real blessing unto the world that we're here to be. Holy Spirit, help us to know that God's will in perfect alignment, God's will is the greatest expression of our lives that we could ever have. Cut the cords to every false belief that pulls us out of this. Let us stand strongly and openly to the flow of God's will and God's grace as we say, use us, use us, use us, use us, use us. Take a deep breath. Someday the day shall come when all the glory shall be thine. People will say it is yours, but I shall deny, not mine. Okay. It's by thy grace. Yes. Yeah. That I sing, oh yeah, it's by thy grace, oh, that I sing, it's by thy grace, that I sing your holy name. And so with gratitude. I release this prayer into the action of the law, knowing that it is fulfilled, it is done, and so it is. Amen. Allah, Jehovah, Rama, Satan, Amen. Take a nice deep breath. Thank you, sweet spirit, for the fulfillment of this prayer. Mm -hmm.